Thank you, Francisca. Thanks so much. Well, I wouldn't come 10 times if I didn't like it. Come on up stage, guys. Um, I think DLD is one of the great events I've gotten. I have to admit, plenty of great ideas for my own events here, and I've been inspired many times by, by the passion, frankly, that DLD represents. And in fact, related to our topic, we like to think of techonomy as a mission-driven enterprise where we really are driven by a belief that what we're doing matters, helps people understand the nature of technology change. And I feel DL DLD is similarly uh, an organization driven very much by passion. And uh, Steffi, and in the earlier days, Steffi and Marcel, and of course, uh, Hubert and Yossi, the, the, the motivation to do it is really beautiful. And it, it's amazing how well it comes together. So enough of an ad for your great conference, Hubert. So this session, um, it's a little abstract, passion and ownership. And we had a lot of discussion about what is it really about. So I'm gonna give you a sort of my general summary of what I think we're gonna discuss, and we'll find out whatever it is as we go on, and it definitely will be interesting with this crew up here. I think what we're really gonna talk about is the relationship of the investor to the entrepreneur, and what can be the most effective nexus there, how another theme will be how that relationship may differ in Europe versus the United States, and maybe the most important issue is really what is the way to think about kind of structuring a company conceptually and the relationship between the money and the idea and the people so that you can really have the greatest impact over the long term. And I think these three guys have a lot of interesting things to say about it. Um, just to quickly introduce them, from this side, uh, Klaus Hummels, who you've seen before, of Lakestar, a venture capitalist, major venture capitalist based in, in Zurich, uh, in Spotify. he's on the board of Spotify, among many other investments. Um, Thomas van Koch, who is with a company, a big private equity firm called EQT, which is meant to be something of a joke because it's for equity, because that's what they do. Um, he's also sometimes known as the king of the pipes because he's done so many investments in infrastructure, first cable television and now fiber, which he's doing big, big work in, especially in Northern Europe. Uh, but he also has a huge investment in a major maintenance company that does, you know, has cleaning people and wide range of activities, and he's starting a big venture fund. That's, right. That's the new thing you just announced. That's right. Finally, Max Levchin needs not a whole lot of introduction in this crowd, a serial entrepreneur and an investor, so he kind of has both perspectives. Um, obviously one of the founders of PayPal, for which maybe he's most famous, uh, and he's very closely associated with the Mafia, the, some of whom, one of whom was just on stage, Reed and Peter Thiel, of course. Um, subsequently, he created Slide, a Facebook-related company, just bought, bought by Google. Uh, now he's running two companies, or he started two, and are you running Glow, too, or you're... I'm chairman of Glow. He's chairman of Glow, which is a, a company that's focusing a lot on maternity-related products and insurance, helping women get pregnant, figure out what, how to get pregnant, and then creating insurance products around that. But it's really a stalking horse for a business that intends to understand how to use data to basically disintermediate the entire insurance industry. So he's, he's not an unambitious person, and that's only one of his two companies. The other one, which he's the CEO of, is a firm, and he's advertising it right there, and a firm is doing the same, trying to do the same thing to the banking industry that Glow's trying to do the insurance industry, which is basically completely replace it with a whole set of financial products focused particularly on millennials, uh, which you may talk a little bit about in detail. Anyway, so when you guys think about passion and, and what you do, I mean, what's the first thing you're not in? Thomas, what, what's the first thing that comes to your mind pa when you hear about passion? Well, when you go in and invest into a company, if you don't make it personal, that's the first problem. You personal? Need personal. Because if you don't liaise with the management team and really feel that actually, if you're going to make the CEO entrepreneur something, you're going to make them a hero. So my first comment when I come into a company which we invest into, how can I make you a hero? Because that's really what it's all about. It's not me being owner, looking down, giving dictates. We're in the same boat, how can I make you a hero? All our relationships, whatever we have, is at your disposal. Would that be true both when you're doing venture investing, which you're about to start doing extensively 
And even when you're investing in a pre-existing company, you want to make them more heroic, even if they've been around for decades? Sure. Yeah. Evident to be very demanding. We're a hero, you have my full confidence. But what, 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 I mean, just quickly, what constitutes heroism? I mean, yeah. is it impact? Is it happiness? Yeah. Is it profit? It's growth and fulfilling to building this future-proof company. You know, we, build, we buy companies, we build them, and when we sell them, we look ourselves in the mirror. It should be future-proof. I know it's very aspirational. No company is future-proof, but when it's totally clear sky, no clouds around, that's the time to divest. You know, full R&D pipeline, well invested, and the company's flying. That's when we sell. Klaus, does that resonate with you in the way you think about investing? <clears throat> I mean, for us, it's different. Yeah. So, um, if you do private equity, the basic assumption is that numbers work, right? Mm -hmm. um, for us, the basic assumption is that people work, uh, so that you have a uh, you bond with the people and you, you like them, you like the product, so it is anyway way more on the emotional side than on the number side. Mm -hmm. And if you do not feel passionate for what you do yourself as an investor and as well for the product you invest in, I think you will always perform subpar and, and, and therefore you shouldn't even start it. Okay. So. Mm -hmm. Do you th does the word passion, per se, resonate with you as, a, as something that you think about when you're dealing with the companies you invest in? Oh, yes, totally. Um, because I look at our industry, as venture industry, at outsourced business development people, and you're only a good outsourced business development guy for the company if you feel and breathe the DNA of the portfolio company and you have to be passionate about the, the substance, what they do, because else you do not correlate all the things that you see in your daily life to that company and therefore get it into context with the company and make it valuable for the company. So it has to have an emotional tie and, and to be efficient in, in the way that you do as an investor or outside business development guy. It's weird, it's hard to hear up here, but I think I heard what you just said. <laughs> Much easier for you to hear than it is for us. Yes. Max, so, being both an entrepreneur, a serial entrepreneur, and an investor, what do you think about this? So I, I'm often confused with an Android, as uh, I mentioned, so... Uh, you're, you're called an Android. I've, I've been called an Android, I think by some people in this audience, too, and, uh, <laughs> as they wrote about one of my companies, but... Uh, but you don't I, think of yourself that way. I, I actually kind of like that, but um, <laughs> I think it scares the competition away. So. My view of passion is a little bit different, I think, than most. One of the things that's happening in Silicon Valley and probably in other places, there's an extreme explosion of entrepreneurship. Everyone who's everyone who's anyone is starting a company, which I think is great, at least superficially. But underneath it, there's less rigorous testing going on. People aren't looking themselves in the mirror often enough and ask the question, Am I actually an entrepreneur? They're willing to find out if they are and they're not. That's, that's great, that's fine. But the test can be conducted a priori, and that is, do you have passion for business? Are you actually trying to change the world for the better, which is very important, but not enough? Are you trying to change the world for the better in a form of private enterprise, which is what you should be doing, but that's still not enough. In the end, do you imagine a 100-year-old company with your name on the door creating value, producing positive cash flows? And that last part is very unsexy. It's kind of annoying to like cash flow. Well, you flow. said 20 years when we talked before. You're saying 100 years now? <laughs> Ideally forever. Okay. Like one, of the thing, one of my favorite things to do in Manhattan is walk down Madison Avenue because I get to see the JP Morgan, one of the JP Morgan buildings. And it says something like chartered in 1759 on the door. Mm. And you're like, that's a forever company. If you're building a photo sharing company, it's going to be done in four years. You're not an entrepreneur. You're looking for an exit. So to me, passion is ultimately a combination of making the world a better place through impacting people, but it's also a passion for building a company, something that becomes, you know, for worse excuse uh, or worse example, a uh, chartered member of the uh, local business community, something that is meant to be a pillar of commercial society. <clears throat> so if, if you look at the, in, uh, the successful venture investments, um, be it is on my portfolio, the, the, the Spotify's or the, the Skypes, but especially like Spotify. So, <clears throat> 
the ideal entrepreneur that builds big companies, successful companies, is 20 to 30 technical background and discovers something in his daily life that he solves with technology. So he doesn't care about flipping, he doesn't care about um, money. The only thing is he's so passionate about, passionate about solving that problem that he just starts and then everything comes totally natural. Yeah. So in the Daniel Ek case, he was passionate about music and he was lucky that he was in a house that had very fast fiber at the very beginning. So he had that idea already of distributing music through, through the internet. And if that is the motivator, then the entire DNA of a company is different. And I think that's the best way to, to look at companies that have the highest potential. How important is it for the investor to share that passion? I mean, is it just a matter of supporting it, or do you actually have to echo it and really feel it yourself as well? I, th I think it's totally, totally important, because um, it's important for us as an investor, but also on the flip side for the entrepreneur choosing the investor. Hmm. Uh, so there were situations when we were in boards and the entrepreneur is pursuing his passion, and the, you had to do bold decisions. And those investors that share the passion and the vision, they are supportive in this situation. The investors that are, look at it rather from a financial modeling perspective, they shit their pants uh, and immediately are protective and defensive if it comes to taking more risk. So sharing the passion at the end for the, in, for the entrepreneur makes sure that the guys that support you all your way long have the same mindset, the same risk appetite, and the same um, DNA to make this thing happen. So Thomas, I know that in your new venture business, yeah. you think you're gonna operate a little differently than has sort of traditionally been the case in Europe. Yes, so I'd like you to talk a little bit about what you're planning to do, but also how you think it may differ from the European mindset that has prevailed thus far. Yeah. And you may want to comment on that, and then I got a question from Maxi. We've been quite successful with our model to date, buying bigger companies. Uh, really, when we buy them, we, we take in the best of breed within that industry to populate the board, to really be the sounding board and also help the management team to grow, to get the right qualified people to grow. Because you know and I know, growth is not about money, growth is about getting the right people. So this is the kind of business model we deployed, making large acquisitions. I think this is extraordinarily important in venture capital. In venture capital today, my view in Europe is that there is no powerhouse. There's nobody that can support this entrepreneur the whole way through the A, B, C. In routes. Europe, you mean? Yeah. In Germany or in Europe in general, actually, I would claim. So the entrepreneurs are too much out on the road looking for additional money for the A, B, C rounds instead of building the business. If we could deploy the same mindset as we had during the large acquisitions and the smaller ones, and also getting the right people on board in doing it, which we have, where we have, for instance, Kias Kolen, who, who built uh, Bookings.com, where Yama Wienblad, who started mobile internet in 1994, and we, we have Lars Jernov, who was the guy who really turned around King to become from an online to Facebook and later on a mobile game provider. It, when entrepreneurs should help entrepreneurs, I think there's too much financial guys within the venture capital arena. And, you, and this, I really truly believe, since we also have the volume and the size, we can make the difference. We can be the, the powerhouse, and that's what, what we But we why would an entrepreneur choose a powerhouse? I think the, the, the purpose of having different investors in different rounds is that different investors bring different um, support, and the support uh, ingredients for an A round is different to a B round to a C round so then you must really amass a skill set which is so diverse because maybe for the C round he does need support in China or, or in the US and I, yeah. I doubt that one organization could be able to provide all that. We're not going to do this by ourselves evidently but if we have a person within that knows scaling from A to Z. Nobody can, well, bookings.com is a screaming example of zero, 65 billion dollars. That kind of guys can truly help. It doesn't mean that we're ignorant and think that we know best all ourselves. I know venture capital, we cooperate. But to give the safety to the entrepreneurs not to know, they will know they will have capital the next year. They don't need to think about 
I'm, walking the streets. I I'm think curious. that's extraordinarily important. I'm Why, how do you price the next round then if you want to do all the rounds yourself? Oh, we won't. No, we will team up with you. But we are big boys. So if you or others say we cannot sign up for the next round, we say, hey guys, we're here. I'm curious. So we're not going to do this by ourselves. We're very much in collaboration mode. Either of you Europeans, or maybe Max even has a opinion, you know, the day started with, among others, Oliver Samwer. I'm curious if you would think that he represents another point of view. The different, the different ways to roam, and we have one way. We believe there's a missing gap here in Europe for a big powerhouse that actually can take a company the whole way up. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he's perceived in the U.S. as just being about the money and the power, and you know, it wasn't quite asked about that. But you know, this is you're saying that mindset is a little more common here, a lot more common here. I mean, and, and, and there's a lot of other things that end up happening in, in Europe as a result, even the fact that founders get less equity, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. I mean, any thoughts on that? <clears throat> well, I, I think if you look at the rocket portfolio, it's sometimes uh, it's financed by rocket, but especially if it comes to geographical uh, expansion, <coughs> in most cases there are local financing entities that, that have no local knowledge and are instrumental to making you successful in that region. So mm -hmm. I think for, 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 in my view, if I was an entrepreneur, getting different investors well chosen on board is part of the success strategy that is elementary to, to the different challenges that you yeah. have. Mm -hmm. Max, so you talk about who your investors are in a firm and how you thought through, you know, mm -hmm. who, you, who you partnered with. Um, so I, I think about the value add of investors in a relatively rigorous way, typically when I try to choose my investors, the one of sort of truisms I've learned over the years is you basically choose the one superpower for every investor you take on, and you decide that that's going to be the superpower, and you rely on them for that, and you try very hard to avoid everything else. Not so, just for the money, though. No, no, the money, so there's different levels of a, different stages in an entrepreneur's career, at this point, I've been fortunate enough to be able to choose my investors as opposed to beg my way in. Mm. It wasn't always the case. PayPal was funded literally by the 100th venture capitalist we pitched. 99 told us to pound sand. Wow. So it's been a few times. All the ones that told us to pound sand have now seen the error of their ways, hopefully, or that luck has everything to do with it. And uh, I now have a choice in the matter. What that means, though, is it's not just about the source, just the capital, the source of capital itself matters a lot. The thing that's important is you'll never find a unicorn. If you found a unicorn mm. that could give you dollars and everything you need to succeed, that should be a co-founder of your company. If you've run into venture capitalists mm. like that, tell them to quit their job and join you. Yeah. But that's really not going to happen. Their uh, salaries are too high and they have uh, too many vacations planned for the next 10 years. <laughs> but uh, the, uh, the thing that I try to do is say, well, that guy is amazing at convincing people to see the world his way. So when I'm going to try to close a candidate, he's going to be amazing. And this one is really thoughtful about business models. So when it's time to monetize, that's the person I want the advice from. The important sort of a footnote is don't rely on them for everything else, because he chose a superpower for a reason. Everything else they're not as good at. Mm. And choosing the venture capitalist in time of the company, like you don't really care what your monetization strategy is if you have figured, haven't figured out how to have a single user. So pick your earliest venture capitalist around growth and expansion and hiring and late stage ones around monetization and mm. investing in you know, whatever. So in the case of a firm which is building a bank for the millennial, I wanted people that have operated or invested in many different tax on financial infrastructure plays. And I also wanted people that really understood my approach to building companies because I, you know, not only been called an Android, been called crazy enough times. So I chose Keith Raboy from Coastal Ventures, who was at one point my chief operating officer at Slide, and after the chief operating officer of Square. So the guy, and before then he was at PayPal. So he's seen everything there is to see in different slices of financial infrastructure. He's also someone I've known for more than 15 years now. The other guy is Jeremy Liu from Lightspeed Ventures, whom I tried to hire for the chief operating officer role at Slide 10 years ago. So he too is someone I've known for a very long time. But the thing that he did, instead of joining me at Slide, he became a venture capitalist and basically focused on financial infrastructure investments. So he's the one guy without a math degree who could actually hold the real conversation around Bitcoin, yeah. which I typically find mind-numbingly boring because most people don't understand how the thing works. Mm. So I picked him and I picked Keith because I knew exactly what their superpowers was. Jeremy's a walking encyclopedia on what's happened in the last 10 years in fin FinTech. 
and Keith is someone who knows how to operate and scale a financial services company. Hmm. We have a few minutes left. Uh, anybody has a question or a comment, love to hear that. Um, so, any hands? Nope. We've put him to sleep. To jump in here? Uh, I'm curious, Max, what your perspective is on this difference between Europe and the US. Do you, do you see a fundamental sort of, especially when it comes to investing, you know, mind, mindset differentiation and, and maybe how the passion might even enter into that? So I think the general trend is it's converging. I think 10 years ago, you meet people that say, oh, I'm an entrepreneur from Germany. And you would say, oh, I understand what box to put you into. You're thinking that a success would be a $100 million exit. You personally own 45% of your company. Your employees own five. And you have a venture capitalist that controls your board and controls your cap table. Mm. And he's telling you, I am very happy with a $100 million exit. And if you're going to hold out, I'm going to try to throw you out. And that was kind of the stereotype of the central northern European entrepreneur. These days, talk to somebody like Daniel Ek or people that have run big international scale companies, they're no different than Silicon Valley guys that basically say, yep, I've taken three rounds of financing. I own 15 to 25% of my company. My employees own about 50 to 25% of my company. The rest is split across multiple funds. And I've been thoughtful enough where no one controls my board. I control my fate. This is, I'm not a slave to an investor. So mm. the trend has been towards more like Silicon Valley companies. But one of the weirder sort of uh, observations that I've seen is you can actually really, really do see this in term sheets. So every time you look at a venture term sheet, you can see the giant movement from the west to the east. So Silicon Valley term sheets are typically most progressive. East Coast ones are slightly more messed up. And the ones in Europe are horrendous. That, that was definitely <laughs> true 10 years ago. Five years ago, the East Coast ones have finally grown up. And the European ones became a lot more like the East Coast of 10 years ago. And now it seems like it's all over the place. But five years ago, it was not strange to encounter participating preferred in New York. And you're like, what? That, that doesn't happen where I come from in Silicon Valley. In Europe, you're like, it's participating preferred and your baby and naming rights on you know, your next 15 businesses. And by the way, like, cuff yourself to this wall. And these days, it's a lot, I think, more like you know, just basic term sheet, no crazy antidilutive preferences beyond normal, et cetera, et cetera. So I think the trend has been for the positive as far as I'm concerned. Um, Thomas, going back to this passion point, mm. and, and, and from the standpoint that, frankly, in the end, I'm most interested in, is, is sort of related to what you touched on and what Max was really talking about in the 100-year model. I mean, yeah. building companies that really matter because they make the world a better place. Yeah. I mean, just talk about your mindset in terms of that. And it seems sure. like that's how you're hoping to position your new venture fund and, right. and something that you, I mean, even when you're investing in fiber, are you thinking of it a little bit in that context? Yeah. yeah. We can start with EQT. I'm one of the founding partners, and we're backed by the Wallenberg Group, one of the few industrial families still remaining in Europe. And they were created in 1850, and they're huge. You know, as I run the firm, since I'm an entrepreneur myself, I run the firm that in five years' time, we shall have no single point of failure. So when I get a heart attack or being hit by a truck, nothing will happen. That's how you should build a company. And that's what we intend to build a company, which we acquire the bigger ones, but also the smaller ones. We'll back the entrepreneur. We're going to do whatever we can to make the entrepreneur succeed, but we're also going to tell the entrepreneur, you know, you have a legacy way beyond yourself. You need to safeguard who will succeed you when you end up in a divorce or whatever. You have a, you have a responsibility way beyond yourself, and that's our view of the world. I don't know, and that's for Klaus to react upon, if that contrasts to the venture capital world in Europe today. That's our view of the world, and I, we think, you know, that's the right way to build businesses. Unfortunately, we're low on time, but does it contrast, do you think, to the prevailing view? <clears throat> what, that's what contrast? This whole mindset of, you know, something larger than the individual that really has value and will prevail as a positive force regardless. <clears throat> well, I think it doesn't contradict. I think it's part of the ecosystem. Out of thousand companies that need to get funded, yeah, maybe one or two are those, otherwise the whole mathematics wouldn't, wouldn't add up. Yeah, so I think it's a nice wish thing, but on the way to there, um, st that's a statistical survivorship bias. Yeah, you should start with that attitude, and then if you're lucky, you get there, but <clears throat> on the way there, like 95%, 97% won't get there. Of course, yeah, so yeah. that's why I don't see a contradiction. I think it's just a mathematical equation. Sure. 
Well, they, they shortened our time a little, but we've had a good conversation, and thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, guys. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Max.